Lopez. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive presentation. <laughs> anyway, those are a thing of the past which is not uh, very important now. What is important is I need to prove just like a defendant in a certain case, I need to prove beyond reasonable doubt the, the information that were read before you. And I hope I can prove the same with the quantum of evidence necessary for the conviction of an accused. <laughs> All right, good morning to everyone. It's uh, almost, almost 9 o'clock, I suppose, and we were supposed to start at 8.30. Of course, uh, I will not uh, excuse myself because of the traffic. Uh, as usual, that is the uh, common alibi of uh, mo most uh, people who, are, uh, uh, who have an appointment. But uh, before I start, let me just uh, tell you something about uh, uh, a person caught in the traffic. Uh, as usual, many people just to avoid traffic violate these uh, traffic rules. And there was one who was caught violating this traffic. And he was apprehended by the policeman. And as usual, what does the violator do? Ano? Oh, you know that. Oh, okay. The the person apprehended attempted to bribe the policeman, di ba? As usual. And the offender told the policeman, Mr. Policeman, I will give you this day your daily bread. But forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The policeman meekly smiled and he said, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. With those prayers, there was no bribe. <laughs> you see, I know all of you, every one of us here, knows how to pray and we will be doing we are already doing a lot of prayers to ease up our sufferings and tensions and pressure in taking up the bar exams but mind your class after the bar exam especially when you are already waiting for the result the more prayers you will do <laughs> All right, let me start. Of course, I, I know you already have this uh, SILA boost for the 2013 bar examination. It is the same syllabus which was used since 2011, 2011, 2012, and then this is the third year that this syllabus has been used. Although it is not always follow it is not always there are still matters which are given not contained in the syllabus but nonetheless we will still assume that this is the correct syllabus because there was already a promise coming from the chairman of the bar exams that this will be strictly followed in the uh, preparation of the questions of your bar exam. So I will limit myself with the syllabus plus, of course, related areas, related areas from uh, related areas uh, involving the subjects under this syllabus. And uh, if you will notice, the the, the first. Uh, thing that we should take into account is the uh, fundamental principles. P 
fundamental principles. We still need to define what a criminal law is. Although everyone, everyone already knows what is a criminal law. But how or why do we need to know the definition of a criminal law? Bakit natin kailangan? Alright. For purposes of statutory construction. For purposes of statutory construction and the application of your constitutional limitations. As you will note, a criminal law must be strictly construed against the government and in favor of the uh, accused. Plus, the constitutional restrictions like ex post facto law, bill of attainder, etc., are strictly applicable to criminal laws but does not necessarily apply to uh, 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 procedural laws or other kind of statutes. Okay? For instance, for instance, this matter of ex post facto law regarding the retroactivity of a penal statute. See? Retroactivity of a penal statute. This would strictly apply as a matter of right when it involves a penal statute. But other kinds of statute, it is not mandatory, it is not strictly applied. Take, for instance, the matter of suspension pendente lite. You know what is a suspension pendente lite. It is a preventive measure under uh, Article 24 of your Revised Penal Code. Now, in one case class, the accused who was met with this kind of suspension because he was charged under Republic Act 3014 said that this will not apply to him because at the time the crime was committed, there was no suspension pendente liti yet. And secondly, this partake the nature of a bill of attainder because he is already being penalized even without trial as he will be suspended pendente lite. And suspension is a penalty. He could not be penalized without due process and hearing. The Supreme Court said, this suspension pendente lite is not a penal statute. It is a preventive measures and therefore your principles of ex post facto law, strict interpretation as well as the bill of attainder is not or are not applicable, you see. In the same way as your circular BP-22, remember what is the penalty BP-22 under the Supreme Court circular? Anong penalty? Sabi na Supreme Court, preferably, preferably, you impose a penalty of uh, a, a, a fine and not an imprisonment. And the Supreme Court clarified that this a circular did not abolish or delete the penalty of imprisonment, but merely a, a preferential penalty. Okay. There was a person charged and convicted of BP-22. He was incarcerated and met a penalty of this this matter of imprisonment and after while pen, pending his imprisonment be this this circular was issued by the Supreme Court providing a preferential penalty of fine so the accused now filed a writ of a petition for a writ of habeas corpus seeking for his release and that he should only be fine. In other words, he want 
the circular to retroact in order that it could be benefited by this preferential penalty. One of the reasons why the Supreme Court denied the petition is that this circular is not a penal statute. So that even if it is favorable to the accused, pursuant to Article 22, retroactivity of a penal statute, it will not, as a matter of right, retroact for the benefit of the accused, precisely because this is not a substantive penal statute. It is merely a circular or a resolution, similar to a resolution of the Supreme Court, directed the imposition of a fine as a preferential penalty. Okay? Alright. So, we will define what a criminal law is. And as you will note from the definition, a criminal law, is a substantive public law that define what a crime is and prescribe the penalty. From that definition class, you will note the elements arising from the definition of a criminal law. The nature of a penal statute and which consists of two, three basic elements. Substantive, public, and all right, imposes a penalty. Why substantive? Okay. You will note the distinction between a substantive and an adjective law. Diba? And substantive is a law that provides or grants a right. And what right is granted by a penal statute or a criminal law? Ano bang right? All right. It is the right of the state to prosecute a wrongful doer and offender, a criminal offender. That is a right for the state to protect itself. Kaya nga yung mga purposes ng criminal law, nando doon. What are the purposes of a penal pen penalty? Nando doon. Those are the rights of the state against an offender. As opposed to an adjective law, ano ang adjective law? It is a remedial law. And you know what a remedial law is. If there is a substantive law, there must be a corresponding law that will enforce the substantive law. Otherwise, that substantive law granting a right will be useless without the procedural aspect. And that is why when we have the a uh, 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 criminal procedure and from time to time also we cannot avoid discussing criminal procedure related to a criminal law as a substantive law all right secondly public in character you know what is a public law it governs the relationship between the state and the people. The cons your constitution is the basic and common public law, which you know. Because it governs the right of the state vis-a-vis -vis the right of the persons or citizens. citizens. In like manner, uh, in criminal law, it governs the government and that of the people. Hence, if you will notice, all, all criminal cases are captions, captioned people of the Philippines versus Juan de la Cruz. Precisely because it is the government which is the offended party. It is not actually the private offended party who is 
the 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 proper party in interest. And finally, the most important element of a criminal statute or a penal statute from the word itself, penal in character, the imposition of a penalty. That is the primordial element of a penal statute. Bakit? The reason is embodied in your Article 21 of your revised penal code. And that Article 21 reflects the maxim nulum crimen nulla buena sine lege. There is no felony unless there is a penalty prescribed prior to its commission. That exactly is Article 21. All right. Very good. So that for purposes of the penalties, these are the basic, basic uh, element that is restricted by your constitution. And what are these restrictions? Restrictions under your constitution regarding the imposition of penalties. Of course, the most important uh, restriction is that no, no cruel and unusual penalty. Cruel and unusual penalty or excessive fine shall be imposed. That is the basic limitation. Now, if a statute provides a penalty of 10 years imprisonment for a simple theft, simple theft, can that, that penalty be questioned? If the law provides a penalty of 20 years imprisonment, for a crime involving acts of lasciviousness, would that be, would that kind of penalty be stricken off because it is cruel and unusual? Basically, class, this severity of a penalty is a matter of wisdom. It is a political, in, it is political in nature that cannot be questioned. This is a, the discretion of the legislature to impose a penalty dependent upon their, their, their wisdom whether this penalty commensurate with a particular crime. What is prohibited is when they are cruel and unusual. Of course, you know when is it cruel and unusual. For instance, if, if one of you who committed a crime against chastity and the government will impose a penalty of castration, will that be constitutionally valid? Of course, you will tell me, I would rather die than to be castrated. That is cruel and unusual. That penalty is not cruel and unusual. It was already sustained by the Supreme Court. However, if the manner how the death penalty is to be executed would appear to be cruel and unusual, then that will be subject to uh, uh, invalidity. As for instance, nowadays it is already taboo for beheading beheading a person. Or let the person be burned to death. Be burned to death. This cannot be allowed anymore because this is a cruel and unusual punishment. But take note, class, that at present, the death penalty has been, do not say abolished. That is the worst answer that you can give me. It was not abolished because 
it is only the constitution which can abolish that penalty. It cannot be done through a statutory provision. Remember, the constitution uh, allows the imposition of death penalty in heinous crimes dependent upon the statute that will be imposed to make the uh, uh, to apply the death penalty all right 9346 prohibits the imposition of death penalty it was not abolished all right note if it is already prohibited prohibited does the court needs to know or needs to clarify in its decision that death penalty is the imposable penalty and therefore the penalty next lower to it which is reclusion perpetua either reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment should be imposed does the court need to clarify and state in the decision in other words if you are a prosecutor will you still file an information that will materially allege the special qualifying aggravating circumstances to bring out a conviction of a crime the penalty of which is death the answer is yes yes why because if death penalty is imposable later on i will explain to you why i emphasize the word imposable from the word prescribed and from the penalty impose siguro at this early i will tell you now para in the course of our study medyo medyo ma distinguish ninyo ang meaning ng penalty prescribed penalty imposable and penalty imposed sir pare pareho naman yan sinasabi niyo meron bang mali if i told my friend the penalty imposed for murder is reclusion perpetua to death meron bang pagkakaiba yan if i will tell my friend the penalty prescribed for for murder is reclusion perpetua to death The penalty imposable for murder is reclusion perpetua to death. Meron bang kaibahan yan? Alright. Apparently, they sounds the same. They mean the same under normal circumstances. Ibig nyo sabihin, under abnormal circumstances, when two lawyers are talking, we are not talking normally. <laughs> for purposes, of precise pre precision for purposes of precision class and for purposes of uh, proper interpretation prescribed is the penalty which is provided in the law yan yung nandyan yung nakasulat penalty in Possible is the penalty which is determined after applying the modifying circumstances. For instance, after determining that there is a mitigating circumstance which is privilege or ordinary and or aggravating circumstances we arrive at that particular penalty then that is the imposable penalty and finally the penalty imposed is the penalty which is found in the judgment technically that is the distinction of penalty prescribed imposable and imposed 
Hence, we go back to that penalty. <clears throat> the court, the court, despite the penalty of death being prohibited, must determine if it is the penalty imposable. So that if death penalty is imposable, after considering the circumstances, the penalty that will be imposed will now be reclusion perpetua, tama? Oy, to be exact, reclusion perpetua without the benefit of parole. Life imprisonment without the benefit of parole. If you will see that penalty class, that means that penalty is imposable. Besides, as to the civil liability, the, 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 the award will still remain, meaning that the civil liability attached to that penalty will still be imposed by the court. Okay? Cruel and unusual. Let me just mention some constitutional limitation as stated in your handouts. Oh, no, 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 no. Syllabus. Equal protection. Due process. Non-imposition. Eh, tapos na tayo. Alright. Death penalty. Tapos na rin tayo. Alright. Bail of attainder. Midanggit na natin. Ex post facto. Nasabi na rin natin. But let me just mention about equal protection clause. This equal protection clause class is related to one of the characteristics of a criminal law. What is that characteristics which is related to general, uh, to, 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 to this matter of equal protection? What is that characteristic? Ano ba ang characteristic na pinalsadyo? Or Characteristics of Philippine criminal law. Right. Generality, territoriality, and prospectivity. Siguro naman ay eh, alam natin lahat yan. And speaking of generality, that is, that is really the principle of equal protection because the law should apply to everyone generality regardless of your religion regardless of your nationality regardless of your color regardless of your what whatever is that regardless <laughs> Nakita mo nga dyan, minsan dyan sa ah, wala na yata, tinanggal na yata eh. The law applies to all, otherwise none at all. Nakita nyo yun? The law applies to all. Kaya lang, nung nanalo si Erat, nawala na. <laughs> nawala na. That is the equal protection clause. But remember class that this equal protection clause is subject to classification. But such classification should be a valid classification germane to the purpose of the law. Remember people versus kayat. Yung mga a certain tribes in the mountain province were prohibited from drinking liquor because of their violent characteristic once they become drunk, they were prohibited. And one of those charts challenged the validity of that law because it is against the Equal Protection Clause. And the Supreme Court said there is a valid classification because these people does not know how to handle themselves once they get drunk. Okay? Then you have this recently the case of uh, Pedea Las yung, yung, yung against Pedea uh, 
ay social justice versus uh, pedea never mind what is that uh, whatever is that uh, title but the issue here plus is the uh, matter of uh, uh, drug testing involving students mandatory drug testing Age, uh, involving students of the secondary and tertiary schools. And there were some groups who challenged the validity of this law based upon equal protection clause because why subject the students? They could be, this, 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 this test could be subject, subject to the, you, subject to use for purposes of harassment so they want to invalidate this drug testing against students and the Supreme Court said no, this is a valid legislation because students short of saying that there is also a classification in the sense that students does not have the absolute right to enter a school this school has a right, has the right to pass a regulation or to maintain a drug-free community or institution. So long as that implementing rule would be reasonable in character, it would not violate the Equal Protection Clause. And true enough, so long as the drug testing is random and suspicionless, that will not violate the right of privacy of the students as well as the Equal Protection Clause. Okay. On matters of due process, maybe you know what is due process, but maybe what I'm saying is the void for bigness rule would still be important to take note. Ano ba itong void for bigness rule? This is rooted from due process clause. If a penal statute is vague, it is not clear, so that we, people of the Philippines, could not determine, could not be clarified what constitutes a crime, more so with the, with the police officers who will not be able to determine the implementation of the law because it is vague, it is not precise. May the law be, be, be assailed because it is violated of your due process clause. But then, the answer is yes. Because this is a due process. However, we can only assail the validity of that law based on this void for vagueness rule in relation to your due process clause when there is already a case filed against you. When you are already prejudiced. Not when there is no crime yet that is charged against a person. Meaning that the law cannot be challenged on its face. Yan yung tinatawag na facial validity. Which is only applicable to your right of expression guaranteed by the Constitution. On its face, a law can be challenged or assailed if it involves a restriction of your right to expression, which is 
guaranteed by the Constitution. But the enactment of a penal statute has, an, uh, has a characteristic which the Supreme Court said, quote-unquote, ad terrorem. Ano yung ibig sabihin ng ad terrorem? That will terrorize or restrict your freedom. You cannot simply assail that on its face and secure a declaratory relief. No, you cannot do that. For purposes of a penal statute, there must be an actual case. That is why, in Estrada versus Sandigan Bayan, famous Estrada, now your mayor in Manila, the Supreme Court, uh, the, 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 the Mr. Estrada challenged the validity of the plunder law. Because according to Mr. Estrada, it is... It is, it, is, it is not clear it is not clear and doubtful what is the meaning of series and that of combination of transaction series and combination of transactions yun ang chinalis niya this is broad and it is not specific it cannot be applied to us because of due process, we cannot determine what really is that crime involved. The Supreme Court defined what is the meaning of combination as well as a series of transactions in the application of the plunder law. Alright. Okay. That is the question uh, regarding the due process clause. Okay. Equal protection, due process, non-imposition, the bill of attainder, all right, ex post facto law. Uh, regarding, let me just mention about bill of, bill of attainder. The case of People versus Ferrer is still one of the cases commonly cited when we uh, discuss this issue of a bill of attainder. Because in that People versus Ferrer, the Communist Party was defined as an organization which is aimed or has the object to overthrow the government. And the Supreme Court clarified that this particularization of the Communist Party did not make the offenders or members thereof immediately liable and punishable under the law. That citation of the uh, Communist Party is merely made for purposes of definition. Definitional purposes. So that if ever any one of them will be, will be prosecuted, there is a need for trial and hearing before they can be convicted. Okay? So, that is the Bill of Attainder, which makes a person liable even without any trial. Yan ang bill of attainder. Okay, okay, okay. Due process, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Pati ako, nagbabasa. Although, I, I have a, usually, if you do not have this, I have a uh, a PowerPoint uh, presentation about this. But anyway, it will, uh, I, will, I did not bring that anymore because I know that you have a copy of this syllabus. We now proceed with the characteristics of a penal statute. And I already mentioned about this matter of generality. In addition to this generality, which I said involves equal protection, the most important thing that you should take into account is the exception. The exception. Isa lang ba exceptions? Exceptions to the pre generality principle. Sino ang hindi nakakalam ng mga exceptions? 
one generally accepted principles of international law. Yung 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 worship crimes committed in the worship in relation to the issue of territoriality. Kasi sa, ito sa generality in territoriality is subject to that exception of generally accepted rules of international law. Embassy as well as warships are extension of the territories where a state should respect and it is not within their jurisdiction. In like manner, as to the person, person, which is the subject of generality, people or persons representing a state in their official capacity. In other words, diplomatic purpose. Representing the sovereign state in their official capacity. Who are these people who come here in the Philippines representing their sovereign state? The president, the vice president, the ambassador or whoever is that person officially sent by another state for purposes of its sovereign function. This people class are accorded absolute immunity whatever crime they cannot be charged or be apprehended. Absolute. Out of respect to the sovereign state. Kasi they are here like a sovereign state in representation of that state. See? However, class, representatives or officials who are here by reason of immunity arising from membership from an international organization like the United Nations, WHO, ADB, etc., etc. The immunity granted to them is not absolute. It is not absolute. But it is relative or functional, if you want the word functional, in the sense that their immunity is limited to the crime which they commit in relation to their function. Even if there is a, uh, a, a treaty, even if there is a, 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 an immunity granted by the Vienna Convention, that is a functional immunity. Two cases so far are leading in this matter of functional immunity. You know this, those old, not old naman, uh, not too old, Minusier versus Escalso and Liang versus Court of Appeals. All right. In these two cases, still the Supreme Court mentioned about absolute immunity vis-a-vis -vis functional immunity. In Minusier, the persons involved are members of the DEA. What is a DEA? The the danger, no, 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 drug enforcement agents in connection with the UNODC, United Nation Organization Against Drugs Convention. This is under the United Nations, in which we are also a member. Okay? In this case, Escalso conducted a 
by bust operation, which turned out negative. Minusher is a foreigner subject of the by bust operation. He filed a case against the members of the day headed by Mr. Scalzo in cooperation with our local agents, claiming that his uh, right to privacy, violation of domicile, as well as damages were filed against Scalzo. In sustaining the immunity of Mr. Scalzo, the Supreme Court said, this is within the function of the day. And since it is within the function of the day, Mr. Scalzo is immune from criminal prosecution. Unlike in Leon, who committed oral defamation, Leon is a uh, uh, an officer of the Asian Development Bank. And his commission of oral defamation has nothing to do with his function as a bank executive, bank advisor. Thus, the Supreme Court said he can be prosecuted and cannot invoke his immunity, which is limited in character. Laws of preferential application, bahala na kayo dyan. You know what is a law of preferential application? Sir, hindi pa. Hindi pa namin alam. Sige. It is just a law which is more superior than a penal statute. Kaya nga preferential. And of course, when we say preferential, we have, of course, the Constitution. Foremost is the Constitution. And what is that provision in the Constitution which provides a preferential application? Of course, you have the immunity of the President during his tenure from any crimes. Prosecution for any crime that may be done after his tenure. Kaya nga si Makapagal, our, gober, our previous president, Gloria Makapagal, is now facing so many charges because at the time she was still the president, she could not be charged. Now is the time. And of course, our legislatures, Madam Miriam Santiago, would freely and immune from talking anything he wanted to during the session because she knows she cannot be charged. You see? She is clothed with immunity under the law of preferential application. Let's go on. Masyado nang madami yan. Territoriality, you know what is the territorial jurisdiction of our Philippine courts. And this is subject to extraterritorial jurisdiction or provision under Article 2. Perhaps you should know that we are a, we are an archipelago. Subject to the rules governed by the UNCLUS. What is UNCLUS? United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. UNCLUS. And under the UNCLUS, all archipelagic states, meaning uh, states which has several or composed of several islands just like the Philippines it is composed of thousands of islands dependent on whether it is low tide or high tide 
and there is a demarcation, a baseline which is connected with the outermost island. And that baseline is the basis to determine the 12 mile, 24 mile, and 200 mile limit constituting the territorial waters, contiguous zone, and your economic zone. We have a jurisdiction over our economic zone. And under PD 1599, implementing the UNCLOS, we can prosecute people who will violate our right to exploit and preserve our natural resources within the economic zone. Hence, we can prosecute alien poaching in our economic zone. Kaya nga lately, maraming mga inchik, inchik, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, Taiwanese who were apprehended in that area. Although, as you know, there is a question about this uh, ownership of a certain uh, areas in that economic zone. But that is not the problem of criminal law. That is the problem of political law. And as you know, the, some uh, countries would, like China would even defy the provisions of the UNCLUS, claiming that, I don't know, they could not be bound by that UNCLUS because of their historical rights over that property. Again, forget about that issue. As far as we are concerned, in criminal law, we have a jurisdiction to protect and preserve our natural resources within that economic zone. So. PD 1599, as well as our fishery law, is effective in that area. Article 2, for purposes of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Bahala na kayo sa English rule at saka French rule. English rule at saka French rule. Sa akin, mamaya merienda ko, French fries. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the, the only demarcation or distinction between this French rule and the uh, English rule is that the crime committed will disturb the peace and security of the state. As long as there is peace and security that is violated, then it could be tried in the Philippines. And you should remember still the nationality principle involving the ship as well as the airship or airplane. The nationality meaning the place where the ship or airship is registered will determine the nationality of that vehicle, whether ship or airship, nationality, and therefore it is that place where it is registered, which has jurisdiction over that ship or airplane. And, of course, in relation to the English rule, that ship or airship must be in a place where there is no, there is no state which has a territorial jurisdiction. In other words, a ship, for instance, must be in the high seas for us to apply this principle of nationality jurisdiction. If it is in the territory of another state, then we cannot apply this Article 2, Paragraph 1, involving nationality because it is within the territorial jurisdiction of another state. But there is a question that was asked whether a crime committed in another state arising from a ship registered in the Philippines. For instance, 
a, a ship owned by the uh, 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 registered in the Philippines is in Singapore. And the Singapore would not recognize its jurisdiction because it involves Filipinos. Wala kami pakialam sa inyo. Magbakbarang kayo yan. I did not disturb our state. We will not prosecute you. All right. So, walang case na na file. They do not want to take jurisdiction. Under that circumstance class, the Philippine can take jurisdiction. Under the principle of protective theory, we have an obligation. The state has the obligation to protect its citizens. And therefore, they can take jurisdiction over those cases happen in a, a ship registered in the Philippines, which cannot be prosecuted by any other state. This is more of an uh, uh, international issue, international issue, but related to Article 2. And other uh, exceptions or other uh, extraterritorial provisions, just take note the other uh, uh, provisions of Article 2. Uh, take special emphasis on crimes committed by public officers in the exercise of their functions. Crimes committed by public officers in the exercise of their functions. You will tell me, Ah, sir, madalian, basta crimes committed by public officers like malversation, uh, uh, anti-graft and corrupt practices uh, committed by public officers outside of the Philippine territory may be tried in the Philippines precisely because it is the Philippine government which is the offended party. Therefore, we can try these people. But there is one issue lately regarding these uh, public officers in the embassy who instead of cuddling these people sino ba yung mga taong AOFW they committed crimes against them against this OFW sila pa ang nagbugaw sila pa ang nang rape sila pa ang will this be will this be uh, 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 within the jurisdiction of the Philippine courts. Of course, I would venture to say apply the provisions of Article 2, which if it is in the exercise of their function, then that crime may be tried in the Philippine courts. See? And in this connection class, remember also the issue regard the principle regarding a continuing crime. What is a continuing crime? It is a crime, the essential ingredients of which occurred in several territories. People versus Tulin is a good example. Kasi, yung, yung piracy is within the jurisdiction of the Philippine courts. So that whatever uh, the, 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 the accomplices, the accomplices who sold the goods subject of piracy under PD, ano yung, yung, yung ating uh, uh, piracy law? Anti-Piracy Act of 1974, PD-532. Persons who aids the pirates or benefit from the goods derived from piracy are not accessories. They are accomplices by specific provisions of PD-532. The acts of the accomplices were committed in Singapore, in a country not in the Philippines but the piracy is within the jurisdiction of the Philippine courts the accomplices challenged the jurisdiction of the court because they said we dispose this property in Singapore where 
the Philippine courts has no jurisdiction. The Supreme Court said, oh, the court has a jurisdiction because these are accessory crimes or accessory offenders. When I say accessory, they are part of the collective liability of the offenders. The principal, the pirates, are within our jurisdiction. Therefore, the disposition of those goods by people who commit a crime in relation thereto are also within the jurisdiction of the Philippine courts. This is uh, similar to a case where, as I have said, a continuing crime where the essential ingredients of the crime occur. For instance, Estafa. Estafa. A certain OFW entrusted a money to be given to the wife of a certain OFW in the Philippines. Alright. The element of abuse of confidence happened in the Middle East. But the damage happened in the Philippines because the wife, the recipient of the money, did not receive the money. Alright. The element of damage occurred in the Philippines even if the abuse of confidence occurred outside the Philippine territory. It is still within the principle within the principle under Article 2. Similarly, in BP 22, may the court prosecute an offender who issued a foreign check. Alam niyo yan. The answer is yes. Why? Because one of the essential ingredients of violation of BP-22 occurred in the Philippines. The issuance of the check on account or for value of dito. Although the dishonor is done in the United States because it is a foreign bank. We have a jurisdiction. Yun ang reason in People versus the Bilia versus Court of Appeals, where the Supreme Court said the Philippine Court can prosecute an offender who issued a foreign check. And finally, under paragraph 5 of Article 2, crimes against the law of nations. Oh, against it obviously, piracy, it can be tried in any place where the ship passed by or has duck. And crimes against national security under Title One. Note, crimes against national security. Security. Rebellion class is not a crime against national security. Rebellion is a crime against, very good, public order under Title Three. Example of crimes against national security. We have treason, espionage, misprision of treason, etc., etc. And I would advise you at this time not do not say at this point in time redundant simply say at this time or at this point let me remind you ganyan ang ganda pala paglagay niyo dun sa exam niyo nako yung reckless imprudence resulting to homicide that is an ignorance of grammar nakakahiya so Reckless imprudence resulting to what you gagamitin. Resulting in ang gamitin ninyo. You know, the examiner, even if you are correct, once they see the English grammatically wrong, masama na ang impression. Masama na ang impression. Yung isa, tama sa God. The taking of the property, blah, 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 is a violation under Article 2209. The crime committed is a thief. T-H-I-E-F. That is the crime committed. Eh, tama na lahat. Pagdating sa tulong conclusion, the crime is thief. Patay. Did you give the, this, this person a full credit? 
we will even doubt whether this person should become a lawyer, you see? Even if the crime that was committed is correctly a crime under Article 2209. Theft! Ginawang thief! Naging, naging tao yung object. Yung estate, binagyan ng E before estate, naging estate. Oh, you see? Be very, very careful. Maybe you will say, slip of the finger. Pero, naulit. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, uh, twice mentioned. Thief, at saka estate. So, applying the principle of benefit of doubt, hindi nag-apply. Because apparently it was intentional, dolo in character. <laughs> it was not a mere culpa. <laughs> Alright, well, ano no ba? At this point, yeah. <laughs> At this point, uh, I would, I would. I could not direct you, I, I cannot sanction you, eh. but I would uh, tell you to do. Short of saying, dapat gawin na ninyo. Uh, familiarize yourselves with the different titles, at least you should know the different titles. Kaya kanina here, one of the ladies said, Title 3, Crimes Against Public Order. Very good. Title 1, Title 2, Title 3, Title 4, hanggang Title 14. Memorize what are these titles and familiarize yourselves with the different crimes. For instance, Title 7, Crimes Committed by Public Officers. Ano mga yun? Alright, sir, you will tell me. Ah! Malversation, bribery, ayan, infidelity in the custody of prisoners. Title 11, crimes against chastity. What are those? Acts of lasciviousness. Rape, wala na rape. Because it is now a crime against persons. And you would know that in crimes against chastity regarding this matter of de officio cases, you see, applied in Title 11, not applied to the crime against persons. Maramian, memorize what are the crimes under Title 13, crimes against honor. Ano ba mga ron? Hindi acts of lasciviousness, but libel. All right. Uh, incriminating against an innocent person. What is the advantage of knowing this? One, recidivism. If you don't know that a certain crime is defined under the same title, you wouldn't know for sure what is recidivism. You wouldn't know that yung palang unjust vexation is a crime against personal security. Not personal security and liberty under Title IX. Which is, which is, which includes the crimes of great threat, great coercion, kidnapping, and therefore, kidnapping, unjust vexation, they are defined under the same title, there is recidivism, you see. Hindi naman just familiarize yourselves with the common crimes. Hindi naman siguro tatanungin sa inyo ng, uh, one, ng, ng, ng examiner na what is the nature of the crime involving refusal to uh, refusal to assume an elected public office. Is there such crime? Yes, under Article 2, 3, 4 of your Revised Penal Code. A person who got elected will refuse to assume 
That is not the character of the Filipino people. Because they spend a lot of money. They commit fraud. They cheat just to get elected. Now that they got elected, they will refuse to assume position. No way. No way. That is not the kind of mentality that we have. Very common crimes lang. Common crimes lang. And in one, uh, in one, uh, in one, in one uh, bar exam, it was asked. Eh, naman, it may be in a problem or it may be objectively. It was asked. Distinguish violation of domicile, domicile from trespass to dwelling. Ah, sir, madali yan. So, i-define ninyo ang trespass to dwelling, i-define mo rin ang violation of domicile. But supposing the examiner says, give at least two distinction. Uh, di kailangan mo pa ng isa. Or perhaps, nakalimutan mo kung ano ba yung specific distinction. But you remember the title. O, oh, sasabihin mo na ngayon. Uh, trespass to dwelling is a crime which is defined under Title 9 which is in the nature of a crime involving personal security and liberty unlike violation of domicile it is a crime against the fundamental law of the land under Title 2 of the Revised Penal Code Ah, your examiner will tell you Ah, this is perfect 101%. <laughs> Very good. Alright. We are done with the territoriality principle. Regarding prospectivity class, take note the, 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 the principle of your statutory construction in relation to Article 22 of your revised penal code. As a rule, prospectivity, but it may also retroact. And as I have mentioned a while ago regarding this matter of strict interpretation in relation to a penal statute, remember that case of Lakson versus Lakson versus Ortopapits, Lakson, well, whatever is that case, Lakson regarding the uh, time bar rule. Alatandaan nyo yung time barrel? Which Mr. Lakson argued that it should be applied retroactively because it is beneficial to him. This, this, this case originated from the uh, Oratong Baleleng case which for several times na dismissed na na dismissed. And it was dismissed uh, in the regional trial court. And it was refiled. Under your time bar rule, refiling cannot be done within a period of one year or two years as the case may be dependent upon the penalty prescribed for the crime, whether it is more than six years or less than six years. At the time your revised penal code came in revised penal code, revised rules of criminal procedure became effective almost two years had gone past almost two years na from the time there was a dismissal of the case. So Sabini Lakson nung i-file ang case sabi niya prescribed na kasi nawala na it was filed after more than 2 years applying the retroactivity ang sabi ng Supreme Court one of the reasons denying that petition the Supreme Court said that is a criminal procedure it is a procedural law and it is not a penal statute where the right of the accused can be invoked, where that uh, retroactivity can be invoked as a matter of right. 
sabi ng Supreme Court, this is a procedural law which will not retract as a matter of right more so that it will prejudice the government. Kasi kung magre-retract, nawala na yung right of the government to refile the case. Which under the law is two years. In other words, that two years should be computed from 2001 until 2002. Dapat within that period, pwedeng i-refile ng government. Ang sabi ni Lakson, porke na-dismiss ang kaso 1998. 2000 effective. Sabi niya mag-retrack, wala na, hindi na pwede. No, sabi ng Supreme Court, that cannot be done. This is a procedural law and not a substantive penal statute. Alright. Prospect, isa pa, prospectivity. While it is a matter of right. Marami tayo dyan. I mentioned a while ago regarding this uh, pendente lite. At the time the accused was met with suspension the crime committed was before the enactment of the law. In other words, when he committed the crime, wala pang pendente lite. Wala pang pendente lite. Now that he was charged, meron ng pendente lite. So sabi ni, ni, ni accused, this cannot be done because this is a penal subject. Dapat prospective lang prospective, it will not be applied to him because he committed the crime before the enactment of that pendente lite. Ang sabi ng Supreme Court, no, this is not a penal statute that should apply strictly prospective in character and liberally if it will retroact for the benefit of the accused. In other words, that pendente lite retroacted and did not violate Article 22 of the Revised Penal because it is not a penal statute. Meron pa isang magandang kaso. Meron pa isang magandang kaso. Yung extradition. The crime has already been committed. Nagkaroon na extradition. Ex post facto law. Which it was involved. Bakit magre-retro? I have already committed the crime. I cannot be extradited that extradition law should apply to those crimes committed subsequent to the enactment of the extradition law. That is true if that extradition law is a substantive penal statute. But that is not a substantive penal statute. And therefore, it may retroact to, in, to include crimes already committed. Sabi ng Supreme Court. Okay? Substantive, uh, the prospective characteristic. Okay? penal statute. What are the sources of a penal law? Basically, class, there are only two sources. What are these? Revised Penal Codes and Special Laws. What are the crimes penalized? Mala Finse. Special Laws Mala Prohibita. Tama! Tama. Wrong. That is not precise. Because even if the law violated is the RPC, it is not always a mala and se, but may also involve prohibita. Mala prohibita. In the same way that special laws quits 
are generally mala prohibita may also involve mala incest. Why the need to distinguish? Why the need to clarify? Why the need to determine whether it's mala incest or mala prohibita? Bakit? Ah, sir, because of the element of intent, because of the element of malice, and the defense of good faith. Very good. <laughs> That is correct. That is correct. Intent as well as good faith. If it is mala in se, good faith puede, lack of intent, lack of mens rea. Meron din siya nagpayabang. Lack of mens will not constitute mala in se. Nakalimutan rea. Meron naman kayo masyadong magyabang kung hindi kayo sigurado. Meron pa isa. Article 14 defines a justifying circumstance of self-defense. Article 11 ang self-defense. Iho, hindi Article 14. Ang Article 14 ay aggravating circumstances. In short, the, 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 the moral of the story is do not cite a provision if you are not 100% sure wag na kayong magyabang at lalo kayong madidisgrasya sa pagyayabang ninyo. Useless naman ay side ninyo ang article kung di kayo sigurado eh. Sabihin nyo na lang, under the revised penal code, kung di kayo sigurado. Kung hindi kayo sigurado na wala nandyan sa revised penal code, under the law, sabihin na lang ninyo. Wag nyo nang sabihin pa yung article. Okay? Pagwaga, be careful. Alright. There are crimes in the revised penal code which are mala in se, and therefore good faith may be raised as a defense because absence of criminal intent. But there are also crimes which are mala prohibita, in which case good faith is not a defense because what is important in mala prohibita is that the accused perpetrated the commission of the act. It is not the crime which is committed, but it is the act itself which was perpetrated. When we say perpetration or intent to perpetrate, means only that the act was done freely and voluntarily. Meaning, there was an intelligence on the part of the accused to perform the act. That is all. You brought a gun to protect yourself. Your intention is by reason of necessity, which is justified. Are you, are you, are you justified, or can you be exonerated for illegal possession? The answer is no, because regardless of your intent, you may be held liable because you have the intent to perpetrate the act. You issued the check on account or for value. You issued the check on account for value with the intention that it should only serve as a memorandum check, as an evidence of indebtedness. Therefore, I should not be held liable. I am in good faith in issuing the check. Pwede? No, sir. Because the mere act of issuance, knowingly issuing a check, is a crime. Regardless of the purpose of intention. You know what is the meaning of intent? It is the purpose of the accused. Thus, if it is a special law, Determine if it is a mala prohibita or mala ise. As a rule, they are mala prohibita where good faith is not a defense. But if that special law is mala ise, then good faith will come in as a valid defense. Sir, 
give us an example of a special law which is mala in character. All right. Plunder is a special law. But that is not mala prohibita. Violence against women and children is not a mala prohibita. Abuse, child abuse, there must be an intent to abuse. If it was done accidentally or for some reasons not intentional in character, that abuse will not constitute a violation of 7610. Dagdag bawas under your election law. Ano yung dagdag bawas yung election law? Manipulating the election result. If that error in the computation was done in good faith, in other words, it was not intentional. It was an honest mistake. May that person be charged under the election law for manipulation? No, sir. Why? Because that is a mala in set. It is a spatial law. While it is a special law, it is a malance, therefore, good faith can be invoked as a defense. Sir, what is the relationship between the revised penal code and the special law? Ah, Article 10. Sir, layo na natin, ah, wala pa tayong 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Talagang ganyan ang review. <laughs> We can go up until Article 365, Kulpa, because we are already doing a review. In fact, we can even relate this criminal law with other provisions or other laws, civil, constitution, etc., etc. What is Article 10? As a rule, your revised penal code is supplementary to the provisions of special law. That is the rule. Basahin yung article then nakakalito because it starts with a proposition that it is not supplementary. Hindi ba? In your first sentence, provisions of the revised uh, crimes in the which are in the future punishable, the, supre, the, the revised penal code is not supplementary. But the second sentence provides that it is supplementary. Diba? All right. In other words, class, in all cases, as a rule, except, except. When the law, the special law provides otherwise, oh, well, that is self-explanatory, or it is inconsistent or impossible to apply. Following the principle of generalia specialibus non derogant, a general statute would not derogate a special law. Or you want the more common statutory construction that in case of conflict between a special law and a general law, it is the special law which should prevail. In relation to prospectivity, in relation to interpretation of a penal statute, include Article 10. Now, when is it inconsistent or when is it inapplicable more often than not this is applied in terms of penalties the penalties under your special laws has a specific characteristic which is conflicting with that of the revised penal code. For instance, yung penalty na 10 to 15 years, penalty na 5 to 10 years, 
penalty na one year, etc. is inconsistent with the application of the penalties under your revised penal code involving reclusion temporal, arresto mayor, etc. Et walang divisibility, walang penalty, next lower in degree, ang life imprisonment. Unlike reclusion perpetua, merong penalty next lower in degree. The rules regarding the penalties involving reclusion perpetua cannot be applied to life imprisonment because they are not the same. And their nature is in conflict with the rules found under the revised penal code. A minor committing a crime, the penalty prescribed, oh, kita nyo, ha, is life imprisonment, cannot be benefited by the provisions of Article 68, one degree lower. Unless the law provides otherwise, like your Section 98 of 9165, ano sabi ron? In case of a minor, the penalty of life imprisonment to death shall be reclusion perpetua to death. Yun ang sabi ng Dangerous Drugs Act. Ano ibig sabihin noon? If it is a minor who is involved, violating 9165, the penalty of which is life imprisonment to death, the court will impose reclusion perpetua to death so that they can avail of the privilege mitigating circumstance. Apparently, class, apparently, if the special law impose or prescribe a penalty the same as that of the revised penal code, then Article 10 is applicable. So, for instance, if a certain special law provides a penalty of reclusion, temporal prison correction, ah, that is subject to the visibility, mitigating, aggravating, or even one degree lower, applying the revised penal code by analogy or supplementary application, unless it is provided otherwise. Subsidiary penalty, pwede? The answer is yes, because it is not inconsistent with the provisions of the special law. So that in violations involving BP-22, as well as libel under Article 300, 54 and 55 which under the Supreme Court Circular ano ang penalty ngayon ng BP-22 tsaka libel ano penalty? wala naman nandito sa handout ninyo si Circular bla 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 tignan ninyo nasan na yung Circular na yung crime against uh, uh, Bouncing check. Ayan, sa bouncing check. Clarification of administrative circular increasing the penalty of administrative BP-22. Ayan. 13-2001. And then, in crimes against honor. Page 6, number 13. Include administrative circular 2008. Guidelines in the observance of a rule of preference in the imposition of penalties in libel cases. Preference of imposition of a fine. Page 6, number 13. What is the importance of subsidiary penalty? In one old, old case, Old, old case. <laughs> old, old case. The accused was charged with a violation of a special law. The court imposed 
Pagkakaintindihan na tayo, impose a fine with subsidiary penalty in case of insolvency. The accused challenge the validity of that penalty of subsidiary penalty. Arguing that he could not be required to serve a subsidiary penalty because there is nothing under the special law that requires him to serve a subsidiary penalty. The Supreme Court said no. Because by supplementary application of the revised penal code pursuant to Article 10, that subsidiary penalty may be required for a violation of a special the penalty of which involves a fine. And therefore, following that ruling uh, in relation to uh, libel and BP-22 as provided under the circular, these people or violators can be subjected to a subsidiary penalty under Article 39. Okay? Article 10 and Article 39. Alright, let us take a 15 minutes break.